Introduction to Bioinformatics, Part 2. In this part of the lecture, we're going to start looking at some other applications of bioinformatics. The first of these is genome sequencing. So how is DNA sequenced? Well, the classic approach is what's known as the Sanger method, the dideoxy chain termination method. More recently, so-called next generation methods have been developed. And these are highly automated, very fast and very cheap. The problem, however, with both of these methods is that they're only able to sequence relatively short stretches of DNA. So how can we apply these sorts of sequencing techniques to entire genomes, i.e. long stretches of DNA? So in the, the Sanger type methods, we're only able to sequence up to around about 2,000 base pairs of DNA uh, in one sequencing run and for the next generation methods depending on the particular method it's generally less than 600 base pairs. Well let's take an example of what we do. So here I've got a passage of text that's been split up into overlapping fragments. So what we want to do is take the first of those fragments, look at the beginning of it, and see where it might match the end of another fragment. So we have a match here. We can join those bits together, and then we repeat the process. And we keep doing that until now the beginning of this uh, sequence up here doesn't match the end of anything else so we have a look the other way around and we find that the end of this matches the beginning of the other remaining sequence. So uh, I hope you recognize this passage from Shakespeare uh, and it's been suggested that this is actually quite a good analogy for what goes on in the cell. All the world's a stage, well that is your cell. All the men and women merely players, those are the genes. They have their exits and their entrances, well you can switch a gene on and off. And one man in his time plays many parts, well that's been likened to this idea of alternative splicing. In the real world of course, doing this sort of thing is a little bit more complex than the uh, example that I've shown. Uh, we have to make sure we have as big an overlap as possible. Uh, we have to enforce some sort of minimum overlap size. Uh, given that we uh, have four different DNA bases, if we only overlapped one base, then there's a one in four chance that we would do that simply at random. If it's two bases, one in 16, and so on. We also have to allow some level of fuzzy matching, in other words, accounting for errors in the sequencing, because the ends of segments quite often have sequencing errors. So by combining the size of the overlap with uh, the quality of the match, we can then apply some sort of confidence score. There are also problems with sequence repeats, and I don't have time to go into that in any detail. One of the things that I mentioned in my description of bioinformatics was that we can use analyses of data in order to perform predictions. And generally these days, those sorts of things are done using software known as machine learning methods. And this has really become an essential tool in bioinformatics. Machine learning, then, is a general class of computer software which learns from examples and then is then able to make predictions. So the main concepts that of machine learning are that we start by training a machine learning method with examples of whatever data we're interested in, for example, transcription start sites, intron exon boundaries, sequence composition, secondary structure of proteins, uh, and so on. The method then learns features from those real examples 
and you can apply the trained system to make predictions. There are many, many such methods, including neural networks, support vector machines, decision trees, naive Bayesian classifiers. Uh, I could go on and on. There are lots and lots of them. But neural networks are quite an interesting example because they borrow from ideas about how the brain works. They consist of many interconnected so-called neurodes or perceptrons. And they're in layers. So there's an input layer, which has the information that we're training on, such as uh, a piece of protein sequence. That's then connected to a hidden layer. And that, in turn, is connected to an output layer, which describes the characteristics that we're trying to predict. So during the training, we might say, here's a bit of protein sequence, a little window of, say, five residues in this case. And uh, our output is either this is uh, beta sheet or alpha helix, or neither, if neither of those is switched on. So this type of approach Basically, what you do is you uh, give it lots of these patterns. And what the system does is to learn these weights that we put on the connections. So if we look at one of these uh, neurodes by itself, it's very simple. It's just a simple mathematical operator. It takes these inputs, capital A, B and C, and it learns these weights, little a, b and c, so that the output is some simple function of weight little a times input big A plus b times b plus c times c. In doing that learning, it's trying to minimize the errors that it sees uh, in the, the predicted outputs compared with the actual outputs. And then once you've trained it, you can apply it to doing real predictions. Moving on then to look back at the data sources again and looking at annotation which is really the human factor in all this. What do I mean by annotation? Well obviously the authors or the, the scientists who uh, did the work, uh, references to papers, methods that you use, cross-links between databases and data banks, so-called feature tables, highlighting segments of biological significance, such as coding regions in DNA or active sites uh, in protein sequences of enzymes. But also more general descriptions. The problem with these is whether they can be parsed and understood by a computer. Obviously, uh, a piece of text is easy for a biologist to read, but if you're trying to analyze data automatically, then uh, these pieces of text may not be uh, comparable in a sensible way. So often we use things like so-called restricted dictionaries of particular keywords or ontologies, which are a bit like dictionaries that form trees uh, in order to uh, describe these things so that they can be compared automatically. So just to give an example of an ontology, um, we could apply that to names of uh, animals. So we could say that um, a mammal inherits all the characteristics of an animal, but also has uh, specific characteristics of producing milk. And similarly, we could say that a lion inherits all the characteristics of a mammal and therefore all the characteristics of an animal and so on. In the pre-genome world, if somebody bothered to sequence the DNA or the protein of a particular gene or protein of interest, then that would be done by a single group who had a particular interest in that gene or protein. The annotations then would be grounded in experiment and written by the real experts in that gene or protein. 
Now, the quality of the raw data, in other words, the, the sequence information or structure information, is as good as the methods that produce it. And peptide sequencing has largely been replaced by DNA sequencing using completely automated methods that are much more reliable and accurate than the old-fashioned methods of doing these things. So the raw data quality is improved, but the quality of the annotations is only as good as the curators. In the genome world, there's rarely experimental confirmation of expression of putative genes or characterization of gene products. Annotation is based on computer analysis, and that's been described as the weakest link of genomics. Getting it right is labor-intensive and underfunded. And some people have gone as far as to say that poor annotation really negates the benefit of having genome sequence data at all. So how reliable are the data? Well, here are a few quotations from people working in the field. Michael Ashburner from the European Bioinformatics Institute, who led the Gene Ontology Consortium, said that GenBank is full of mistakes. Douglas Crawford from the University of Missouri said that the utility of GenBank has declined greatly. And Terry Atwood from Manchester, uh, who used to be at UCL, said, we have to educate people about databases so that researchers don't assume that they're right. Now, here are a couple of real-world examples. Uh, Keith Yamamoto, a biochemist from UCSF, said scientists would rather share each other's underwear than use each other's nomenclature. Now, this is an example of a particular protein and the gene that encodes it. And there are, what, 10 uh, different names here for the same gene because different groups haven't collaborated with each other. Even worse, here we have two completely different proteins. Uh, one uh, is a mit mitochondrial respiratory function protein 1. The other one is peptide chain release factor 1. Uh, and they have both been given the same gene name. So this means that annotations are bound to change. As genomic data grow and methods improve, the annotations will improve. The corollary of that is that annotations will be in a state of constant change. And does that mean that completed research projects will have to be revisited? Arthur Lesk, in his book on bioinformatics from 2002, said... Data banks will become a seething broth of information growing in size and maturing, we must hope, in quality. In summary then, handling of data from molecular biology is impossible without bioinformatics. And this is particularly true with the huge volumes of data being generated by the genome projects. Just to summarise then the key points... We looked at primary and secondary data banks. We looked at data banks versus search tools with some examples, those examples being BLAST and FASTA. They are search tools that can be used to search the same types of protein or DNA sequence data banks. We looked at dot plots and the basic concept of trying to trace through that to find the best alignment. In other words, this idea of dynamic programming. We looked at local and global sequence alignments. What are the differences between them and why local alignment is very important when we're looking at proteins or genes that contain multiple domains. We looked at the basic concept of doing fast heuristic database searching with BLAST or FASTA by using some sort of index and made the analogy there with a book. We looked at some very basic concepts of machine learning, in partic particular looking at neural networks, and finally looked at annotation and its problems. <laughs>